Dear ladies and gentlemen, good evening, everyone. Um, happy welcome to NYU Washington, DC. My name is Alexander Nagel. I'm teaching uh, students here. And I'm very yeah, grateful for all of those who helped to get such a big crowd for this event tonight. Um, as we talk about um, Iran, ancient Iran, which happens not so often here in Washington, DC, I want to single out a few persons who helped um, actually in making this event happening. So Tom McIntyre, Lauren Hunt from NYU, DC, Thank you so very much, and also colleagues like Sharus from Aftab also for your help. We are really grateful um, in getting yeah, um, a good group uh, tonight this, for tonight's event. Um, I will just briefly make a few introductions to cultural heritage conservations before we um, have our speaker for tonight. So cultural heritage conservation conversations is thought about um, just dialogue, so we hope that you engage with us. There will be um, after uh, Dr. Allen's talk um, about 20 minutes or so left time for questions and answers. So this is really about a conver conversation that we are planning here for tonight. Um, I will just say for introduction, you remember perhaps that the uh, British Museum and the uh, Parthenon um, marbles have a long uh, debate actually going on for uh, hundreds, for 200 years now actually already about what's happening between Greece and the UK. Um, tonight's talk will actually focus on a, on a, uh, another country, Iran, and um, the, the problems of um, having yeah, Persepolis, the fragments from the same uh, site that was also in the fifth century built like the Parthenon and um, spread all over the world. So it's a kind of a different um, but similar situation in some ways. Um, Dr. Lindsay Allen, who I'm very honored to have here tonight, is a lecturer at King's College in London. She published a book in 2005 about um, the, per the Persians, a history which was called A Triumph. And I, I, th I think um, yeah, I'm speaking for many here. It was a very accessible um, introduction to ancient Persia. So um, wonderful book um, that I can recommend. So also for the last um, yeah over 15 years probably already, Dr. Allen is working on a project that she will introduce um, to us to tonight, um, mapping Persepolis all over the world. Dr. Allen had also a lot of fellowships held at Oxford in um, New York, in Chicago, in Cincinnati over the years. And so there's um, quite a bit of um, yeah, archival research that went in everything that Dr. Allen is doing. She will introduce us to the site of Persepolis um, tonight. And so I hope you um, have many questions afterwards, so I give the floor to Dr. Allen, and I'm thanking you and her for coming tonight. Well, thank you, Alex, for that really wonderful introduction, and thank you again um, to the team here for organizing this really lovely event. Um, I must also thank my uh, sponsor in this research, the Sudavar Memorial Foundation, who have been uh, uh, supporting my travels to a lot of collections and archives to research this project. Um, and also standing behind all of this work are a whole host of archivists, um, curators, and institutional support systems, which I won't have a chance to mention because they are too many um, this, this, uh, this evening, uh, but which you must bear in mind as, as absolutely essential to this kind of work. Um, and I every, every step of this work has really been enabled uh, by other people's support, including Alex's, which has been invaluable and much appreciated. So I start by locating us um, geographically. Um, although um, much of my work for this project has taken place um, outside of Iran for the last 15 years. Um, and um, most of my work is about, at the moment, tracing the um, uh, circulation of Persepolis beyond the bounds of Iran. So this is the primary focus. So to locate the center without which the rest would not exist, but about which I'm not really going to talk so much uh, today. Um, here is the heartland of the Persian Empire. I think this should give me here. But we also have, I hope this Im image gives you this sort of slightly schematic map, gives you the impression of how much in the sixth to the fourth centuries BCE, um, this network of settlements um, of which some were developed into monumental capitals, is in the heart of an incredibly broad territory and had to refer in its ideology and its symbolism to a very wide geographical reach. So there's an awful lot of varied geog geography already built into the heartland of the Achaemenid Empire, 
It's an unprecedentedly large empire. It includes not just um, the older empires of Assyria, Babylonia, and kingdoms of Asia Minor, and some uh, monarchies and states of the Mediterranean, but also Central Asia, um, and Iran, and the borders of India, um, and the Caucasus in terms of in geographical terms. So you have a vast coverage with no particularly definite edge, a great number of different peoples moving in and out of the um, of of the uh, kind of political sway, political systems of political observation, uh, ob obligation within the empire. Um, and therefore, it's a very complicated um, set of networks and structures that the monumental capitals that we are reconstructing, investigating, exist within. In this system, therefore, we actually have multiple capitals, not just Persepolis here, which is what I'm going to be talking about, but the slightly older center of Pasargadai, quite close by, and then also across the way, Susa, I'll give you another map of this area so you can visualize it better. Um, and Ekbatana here with a road leading across the rather imposing Zagros mountain range into Mesopotamia where we reach Babylon, Babylon and Babylonia, but also um, the northern um, realm here of the ancient Assyrian heartland too and across to the Mediterranean. Here is a close-up of that region, taking in the Persian Gulf and the Zagros Mountains, showing you how much of a border or a, a, a physical barrier the Zagros Mountains constituted and how key roads moved through in ancient times leading up to Susa and across to Persepolis and Pasargadai, and how this um, series of settlements here existed in, a, in an upland plain, separated from the climate and the world of the Persian Gulf down below by the mountains. And here is an even closer, um, closer map showing you that spot here, Persepolis, and off into this direction, Pasargadai, which you saw on the previous map, and en route to Pasargadai, another settlement here of Istakha, which I'll mention, uh, give you a little bit more detail in a second, and other sites in the area called Nakshirastam, um, and other <coughs> developments, older villages and settlements in this very fertile plain. So to give you this, take you through this historical outline, we have the whole area of the fertile plain of Mavdasht developed, but already settled, obviously, um, in the 6th to the 4th centuries BC, and the early phases, we think, uh, developed in the um, reign of Cyrus and Cambyses now, although previously there was a little bit of uncertainty about how early that started, and then substantially reshaped here under Darius I and his successors at the end of the 6th century BC until the arrival of Alexander of Macedon, who burned the terrace and reportedly sacked the wider settlement circa 330, before that point, we have the place referred to as Parsa or Persai in Greek. And then after the, the uh, destruction of Alexander, we find in Greek texts uh, the city referred to as Persepolis. So it lives on sort of legendarily as a place of uh, spectacular destruction under Alexander. It remains um, present as a ruin and perhaps reused under this in the successor periods after Alexander when the Seleucids ruled the area. And then it continues to be extant and accessible and visitable during the succeeding Iranian empires of the Parthians and Sasanians, and then the kingdoms um, succeeding the Arab conquest, um, and was known by various names, including um, Istakha. It took on the name of its neighboring uh, larger medieval city here known as a place distinct from there called Sadzutun, or a hundred columns, and then later in folklore and history known as Jehil Manar, or 40 columns. And then from 1600 onwards, there's a sort of opening up of access to Iran because of the, Saf the changes enacted by the Safavid um, uh, monarchy, uh, including development of internal communications, um, new, tr new trade agreements, and so on. So there is a great uh, a movement of... Um, of capitals, um, and uh, there is therefore a great increase in access by 
uh, European visitors to the area. And at six, uh, circa 1600, um, in a, a process that I, we can talk about later if people are interested, um, Europeans begin to apply the word Persepolis, the name reapply the word uh, Persepolis to this site. And from that point onwards, it is recognized as, if, as this ancient capital and studied as pretty much the only extant Near Eastern site uh, that's not Greco-Roman, that precedes the, 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 the reign of Alexander. And so if you imagine at this period, certainly before sort of circa 1840, there's very little in the way of other Near Eastern antiquity available for anybody who wants to know anything about um, the history of empires in the Near East before, um, before uh, the Roman Empire and before the Hellenistic period in sort of the reign of uh, Alexander. We have a continuing double identity at least of the site, not just Persepolis in European language texts, but also Chilmanar in Persian text and Tahdi Jamshid um, now in Iranian texts. Um, and so one tends to use Tahdi Jamshid and Persepolis together alternately um, with perhaps varying emphases, but I want to explain that it is a, it is a place of multiple identities, continuous elaborating charisma, as it were, continuous elaborating connections and ideas. Um, and it has been a different kind of place through many different eras. The picture I show you on the right I love particularly because it has the airstrip mapped on it, which was created by the excavators in the late 1930s as a way of accessing the site during a very busy period of archaeological exploration in Iran. So it has, ha it has gone through many different iterations. In terms of the physical uh, neighborhood, um, what I will be mostly talking about is buildings on this central terrace area here, which is now um, uh, labeled in a um, wonderful map produced relatively recently after new excavation work in the plain um, uh, as a sort of a royal precinct or a particular center, ceremonial center, a monumental center. But the areas of archaeological interest are much wider than that, including, as I've mentioned before, Istakha, but also Nakshi Rustam, where there were a series of rock-cut tombs, royal rock-cut tombs, and other um, monumental entities in this very fertile, wide plain. Um, and indeed, the, the railway now runs all the way th right through um, this, this plain, showing you how much of a sort of strategic a uh, strategically important geographical spot this is. Um, there have been some very exciting recent new um, discoveries in the plain, which kind of transform our idea of the wider site and also re-emphasize how much of a, a site it was um, intended to be a, an imperial capital, kind of encapsulating all previous empires, all previous powers um, in the site, uh, in, the, in the area. You have a rock cut terrace based on a rock outcrop. So there's an awful lot of rock quite close to the surface, which is regularized and built up on a sort of multi-leveled complex, starting with a large columned hall, um, an initial entrance to the south, and then a more elaborate monumental massive stairway, and then an increasingly complicated series of administrative buildings which are used actively by scribes, uh, by builders, uh, by work gangs and for administration of various different um, uh, processes related to um, agriculture, worship, um, elite travel, elite landowning in the, in the whole region, all sort of ends up um, running through parts of, um, of this site. But this, this relatively apparently basic initial outline with ambitions for a broader uh, settlement, there are drains there, becomes a much more elaborated series of um, buildings which have stone comprising crucial parts of the structures, including the doorways, niches, um, gateway, um, columns, um, and other sort of transitional zones. So this is not um, about what one might be familiar with if you're at all aware of Assyrian architecture, where one has um, uh, quite a lot of courtyards and a lot of corridors and the use of uh, sculpture and bas-relief in those. What we have here 
is images that are part of the architecture and they are part of the sort of external architecture um, that um, visitors or users of this site will encounter. So the sculpture, and this is something where it comes back to the idea of consider uh, tracing its circulations, the sculpture is the architecture. So if you remove the sculpture, you are also removing the architecture. What you see here is a partially ruined um, bas-relief uh, door jam. So this is just one massive side of a door uh, over which there would be a further lintel and another matching door jam on which you have the king represented um, in audience, enthroned, and then his throne here is duplicated in the structure here, which itself is further held up by individual group individual figures symboli symbolizing um, subjects of the empire. So you have a sort of metaphorical representation of um, the subjects supporting the king in a structure that, it, that itself is supporting a, um, a space which can accommodate both the king and subjects. So you see this kind of cycle of different associations. Similarly, on um, podia kind of... Uh, facade decorations, one has, again, the subjects of the empire, as well as guards, courtiers, equipment of the king, all represented converging on a central entrance to a large monumental audience hall. Um, we don't have exact um, definite evidence. We can discuss this later, too, if anybody is interested, about how this space is used. But we definitely have a, an effort to create a large area in which large numbers of people can commune and a representation of large numbers of people collectively um, representing the di diversity of the empire. So again, there's a multiplicity of figures. A lot of them are quite similar, as you can see even just from this sample of one uh, subject group of subjects from the empire. So you have a replication and also small variations. So you have a kind of crowd of stone. You have a crowd of stone figures. And that has proved a, um, an irresistible temptation to many visitors over the years. This is the kind of state that one can see um, existing all the way through any visual representations of the site, right the way through from the 16th century um, to prior to the excavation in which there are key structures, even though a lot of the site was unexcavated, there are key structures visible above ground because they're held on that rock-cut terrace. They're, hel they're held up um, prominently and can be seen across the plain. Um, this building in particular was much, um, uh, much inscribed with visitors' graffiti over the years, including poetry, meditations on the transience of power, um, it's a fascinating collection of, of so it's almost like a, a visitor's book of, of, of sort of poetic meditation of, uh, on destruction, on ephemerality. Um, and it is the Palace of Darius I, which was even still um, in the early modern period known as the House of Dara within um, local um, uh, tradition and with, within historiographical traditions in the Persian language. So we have a lot of strong associations of the site um, with existing memories of, um, of the royal past um, in Iran. So how am I interacting with this from afar? Well, my study has been about providing um, laboriously and over many years a case study of site erosion through fragmentation. So part of what is, uh, I guess, very much in the news at the moment is traumatic destructions suffered both by people and by sites um, in uh, the course of war and civil, civil disturbances uh, and natural disaster. But one of the things which um, I have found through this uh, research is that the most uh, documentable fragmentation for this site is in fact through um, intentional kind of removals of small pieces. So maybe what people thought was harmless sampling or harmless um, removal of some duplicate figures, and as you can tell, there's lots of duplicate figures at the site. Um, there is a kind of uh, progressive engagement and involvement in taking figures away, taking some of the population away from the site of Persepolis, rather than the intention of uh, obliteration or iconoclasm. And how I've put together the case study is to compile 
historiographical object biographies using um, multiple sources of archival documentation, um, multiply documenting the destinations and paths of objects where I can. What I've been working with is a case study size of about 150 accessible, locatable, stable fragments that are in uh, public institutions that continue to hold these pieces. These pieces are not on the market. Um, and there are circa 50 uh, museums, which and I think I've got up to the rate of having visited about 45 of them, some of them in the last three weeks. So it's, it's been a tiring, <laughs> it's been a tiring itinerary, but very fascinating. The approach uh, in gathering evidence is partly about object examination. I always find things out about these objects um, in, in seeing them in museums that I have not known about before. Um, I, in particular, the nature of their backs, their sides, marks on them, small things that can't appear in photography, even some of the best photography. But also archival research, both in museums, but also personal archives elsewhere, uh, institutional archives, uh, published works, photograph collections, um, and so on. There are a lot of increasing numbers of dealer archives available to research, um, which is a real boon, and I, I hope there are more that will come to light. Museum archives are phenomenally rich, and there is almost an entire discipline to be formed <laughs> um, in the excavation of um, the museum archives that are out there all right now and also the exhibit histories. I'm very interested in how these different pieces are all uh, exhibited and how their biographies are formed through display. Not deployed right now, but hopefully to come in the future. Uh, I'm working at the moment on a strategy of mapping and modeling the geographical movements of fragments as they come away from their source site and thinking about weights, accessibility, transport mechanisms, and infrastructure as part of that. The other amazing thing to do would be to do 3D scan comparisons and 3D comb recombinations and testing of the hypotheses, some of which I'll show you now, about where pieces have come from. And something which um, Alex has worked on, but I sort of reference as something which will, I think, be part of a continuing interaction with the site and with other researchers, um, is the, the comparison of both deposits on and the composition of the stones themselves. So, to give you the note narration, the core of which I will mainly concentrate on between sampling and excavation here, um, is different phases of fragmentation. There is movement of objects, of large structural objects, um, in the phase between the destruction by Alexander and the early modern period. And one of them you see on your right, it's a sketch created by a British visitor um, in 1811 which gives um, the creation of a shrine just outside of Shiraz from a series of, a, a series of doorways from the Palace of Darius, um, which I just showed you in the previous slide. So there is some regional spoliation, but it is used, as far as we can tell, um, where it has survived in buildings that have a ceremonial or a significant religious um, and l very long-term um, uh, life. This building in particular was here for over a millennium um, and was only kind of dismantled in the process of archaeological excavation um, and later restoration of the main site. What I won't also talk about now is the continuing restorations which have happened um, in the latter half of the 20th century and are continuing now. Uh, because that's not really part of my survey period, but I, let me reassure you that that is something which is continuing um, in, with redoubled efforts. Just something also to add that in terms of responses to documented moments of fragmentation, we receive also notifications in some documentations of negative reactions to those fragmentations when some pieces are allegedly removed to beautify the Safavid capital in Isfahan in the 17th century. Um, there is a, a, a reportedly a political scandal. It's kind of a complicated episode, but there is at least the memory of the possible scandal of removing pieces for political reasons from the site. In both Europe and Iran in the early 19th century, uh, the removal of pieces from this site as also the removal of sculpture from the Parthenon at the time is referred to as sacrilege. 
by both British participants in the, those investigations and removals, and particularly, um, let's say, literary observers. So Byron not only criticised the removal of fragments from the Parthenon in the 18 teens, but he also explicitly criticised the removal of pieces from Persepolis um, too. And so that discussion is very much strongly, strongly there in the 19th century um, and continues from that point. When Cyrus Adler visited as a representative of uh, the USA in the 1890s, he commented that pieces should not be removed because it would uh, mar the character of the site. And in 1900, when the British authorities realized that a, an employee of the embassy had removed two pieces and had been trying to export them from Bushir, they were horrified. And he was put on, let's say, gardening leave. Um, and there are the prime minister was notified. So it went to the highest level in the British government. Um, the guy was told off. And the tone of their letters about him is really very enjoyable indeed. Um, so that, that was a wonderful find to find. And then in the 1930s, which is just after um, a cultural heritage law is passed in Iran uh, in November 1930, um, there is kind of across the board an awareness that pieces should not be removed. Um, not just because in Iran there's a, there's a movement to enshrine in law the protection of national monuments, but that, that is really happening across, uh, across the board too, and there is a, an international recognition of this. And what you'll find is that uh, the removals, the time documenting, uh, cross those boundaries. Um, I want to mention a kind of surprising extra, which is kind of slightly out of sequence here, but um, came to me out of sequence as a realization, which is that with excavation in the 1870s, a greater number of pieces might have been vulnerable to um, removal and collection locally by the elite of the time in Fars, which is the, the region um, that the site is on. So it is in. So I, I want to note that this is something that's gradually emerging from my research, but I, it was, it's something that I hope that Iranian scholarship will increasingly elucidate as perhaps the history of collecting and the history of antiquarianism and archaeology in Iran is further explored. From the earliest point in the 18th century, we have very tiny pieces um, in a sort of rubble-like fashion coming away from the site with a Dutch traveler in the early 18th century whose motivation, he said, for bringing the pieces away from the site was in order to prove the accuracy of his, uh, of his drawings. So he was most concerned as an artist with justifying his accuracy um, and wanted to uh, support that. In fact, he distributed his artifacts to supporters and patrons and possibly sold some of them. And only one of them now survives that I have found. And I think some of them, the others will be um, circulating, but one of them is in Paris here on the right, annotated with the book reference of his uh, travel journal. And then on the left, another piece that made its way to Copenhagen um, in the later 18th century. In the later 18th century, with this piece, I have the first British visitor deciding to take some, a little something away, again to give to a patron who had supported his, his, his appointment. And he, in his words, took away a curl, which he, which he said, you will esteem curious, a piece of that noble remain of Persepolis being a lock of curls, which I found ready to drop from the head of a fine old figure in relief. This is something which I want to emphasize is consistent through the reports of anybody who talks about taking a piece from the site. They will try to emphasize that it was separated, harmless, and that they did not damage the, the, the fixed buildings. And that is something that runs all the way through to my terrible British diplomat in 1900 as well. The geography of known samples is in a relatively restricted part of Europe, uh, but I am ready to find more. I think there are some more out there in, in Germany of the 18th century, but they're relatively small pieces. Then we get to a slightly more industrial phase, which is prompted by a methodology of mining through the facades of some of the monumental buildings where they have fallen down over the front of staircases. So what you have in parts of the site, this is actually an excavation photo, but it's illustrating the collapsed state, um, is that these, the, the fixed buildings themselves are not necessarily explored that much, 
Um, but the uh, slabs are being mined and um, uh, brought up and fragmented in order to take them away. And that means that the sculptures on them are in a better condition than the parts of the buildings that have been exposed up until that point. And that's why it is a desirable element. This slide, I hope, illustrates the depth of material um, that you can um, expect for a, an object that has been out of the site for a long time. This is an object which is currently now in Minneapolis, uh, which it reached circa 2000, but it left the site in 1800 in the hands of an East India Company employee who dug it up near the front of um, the facade of the Apadana, the audience hall, wrote about it extensively, it stayed in his family, travelling through his descendants, being displayed in the late 19th century in London. And then when the old family home was liquidated in the 1980s, it was put up for auction and reached the art market and has finally reached its status as a donation in a modern art museum. So there is documentation out there for such things. The facilitating circumstances for this piece are a position in the British East India Company, the fact that there was an establishment in Bushir on the Persian Gulf, which gave access overland from Mumbai, from Mumbai, from Bombay, to uh, Tehran for the British, and also that the, the um, activity of the British during this time was accelerated, um, and that there were a series of embassies that ran all the way up from Bushir to Tehran in that first part of the 19th century. So that there is a, um, uh, I will leave the fascination of Strachey until uh, you if you want to ask about him later, but he was equally interesting to the Iranians uh, as he found the site. Um, so uh, what one finds is that there is a series of incidents in the early 19th century in which individuals record their removal of fragments which they say were not attached to any fixed buildings. Um, but then their, their episodes are often quite complicated. This piece is given to um, a higher up in the East India Company as a sort of mark of trying to achieve virtue, trying to achieve rank. Um, and although the, the individual who took it said that it wasn't attached to anything important, um, he still mentions the fact that he needed cudgels and an awful lot of thing, bribe, items of bribery in order to remove it. And it's the most entertaining letter I ever found. There was... Uh, a moment of disruption in the British Library when I found this testimony of this piece, which is now in the British Museum. So in terms of the mining phase in the early 19th century, we have um, different factors playing in. It's not just interest in the ancient world, although that's part of it. Um, it's also access, individual status, the fact that you have maybe a noble as part of the dipl dipl diplomatic service who has the time and the leisure. He's not working the whole time that he's traveling, and he has the time to go and investigate for himself. He also has the aspiration to move further. These are often young individuals within the service who are trying to gain further promotions. And then the factors in these pieces moving further are networks of patronage, privilege, obligation, the aspiration to cultural capital by displaying fragments in museums, and family status. So sometimes things stay within families um, in order to um, kind of, uh, let's say, ornament their private home. In the, final, in, the, in the next phase, in the 19th century, what we find is a rather more, even more violent, and this one is not excused by people saying uh, um, that pieces were not attached, because as far as I have ascertained, I haven't got um, a particular written uh, account of these removals. But it's what I call scooping and scavenging. And what it tends to be is vulnerable pieces within the upright facades which are exposed in the buildings, which are violently hacked out, destroying part of the relief around them in order to obtain just the sort of human parts of uh, the relief. In addition, there is also a smaller effort um, on the part mainly of uh, the British Telegraph employees to remove disarticulated pieces that are found around the edge of the site that have fallen off the edge of the site as part of the disintegration of some of the buildings. And that's one that you see on the left, which is now in Edinburgh. To tell you more about the scoop phenomenon, here is the piece that came from this, this place in the face of the Apadana on the, on the main facade that a lot of visitors interacted with. Um, and this is now in Vienna. And one can start to match the stones with 
um, the scoop, and this is something I'm still working on verifying completely in every case, often by the distinctive seams of rock that can be recognized through this limestone, this kind of like local limestone that is being used. Uh, but you can see that this guy was seen as a little bit vulnerable because he was on his own in a series of reliefs where everybody else was in contact with each other. So it's kind of the characteristic of the relief itself which leads to the vulnerability. This also happened around the same time um, to a, uh, a, a guard on the same facade, which has ended up in St. Petersburg. And similarly, a half a face here, which you see documented in a 19th century cast, which is very useful for me to uh, inspect, which has ended up in the Victorian Albert Museum, uh, where it remained unrecognized until we unearthed it about a couple of years ago. And here is that face still in situ in a photograph of 1878. So this was removed very shortly after that point because this cast on the left was made in 1891. So one can find a stratigraphy of destruction by applying these different kinds of evidence. And the influential factors in this at this point of uh, removal are the introduction of the overland telegraph in various different phases uh, to Iran, which particularly after 1860 gives access to the British, um, uh, who have a chain of telegraph maintenance offices leading from Bashir all the way up to Tehran, including uh, a local office near Persepolis. Not only is that imposed from without, from, from international enterprise, but it's also technological in innovation invited and adopted within Iran. So this is a period of expansion and investment. Um, it's not a period of warfare or um, civil disturbance. Um, and not only that, but backing up the continued removal of pieces is the need for items to pay for individual advancement within these structures, such as museums, the telegraph service, the civil service, the government, in which antiquities are a sort of currency. And finally, um, what I want to talk about here is something which I've begun to uncover as I've had more access to um, the Oriental, Oriental, Oriental Institute Chicago's records. Um, the Oriental Institute um, excavated the site as part of its expansion into Iran after the antiquities law was passed in 1930 in the 1930s. It had two different site directors, one of whom was ejected from the site under a cloud, possibly for smuggling, allegedly for smuggling. Uh, and a second uh, site director who very successfully brought uh, the remaining uh, excavation to a conclusion as far as he could. Sorry, that should be 239, not 36. Um, and published uh, the findings. They both, though, worked according to the constraints of the time, which is that they had external funders and patrons who also contributed, not just the Oriental Institute, external collaborators on whom they depended for other work. Um, and they were both fairly mobile scholars. And so fines were distributed from the dig, not just to Chicago, uh, but also to other supporters um, of um, the dig. In the case of Persepolis in particular, most of the division of fines did go to Chicago. It was quite strictly watched by the Iranian government. Um, but at the same time, both Hertzfeld and Schmidt did distribute fines from their other projects to other patrons and supporters. The government was uh, granting um, a, a permit at the time for restoration of the site, which included the restoration of a structure in the middle of the site as a domestic residence for Hertzfeld, who moved all of his belongings there, and it is now the current museum. It included the restoration of some reliefs, but it also, the consequence of the, the opening up of the site to excavation, um, prompted preemptive large-scale looting because everybody between 1928 and 29 knew that the site would be scientifically excav excavated, controlled, and documented. And so preemptively, there was an effort to remove a large number of um, items from it and put on the market. And simultaneously with that, the market increased uh, because um, the uh, excavation brought publicity. And this is some of the work I've been doing in um, American institutions because the majority of pieces that are in North America came from this particular phase um, of removal of antiquities. Um, on the left, you see 
uh, a photograph of 1884, showing the kind of division of fragments that we see happening at this point, which is on a scale unheard of before. I've talked about mining, scooping, sampling, but this is the removal of entire slabs, which are then split down the middle and then split in, into individual figures in order to populate different museum collections. And so the one on the far left here is one that you would see now in Harvard here, which one can identify by various distinctive features of the rock. Here, it's fellow, also in Harvard. Um, this piece here is actually also in Boston, so friends together. And this piece is in Copenhagen. Um, and there are a series of other pieces uh, along the back side of that where, um, which have also been redistributed too. Just another sample, I'll give you a couple more examples of these. This is a photograph from 1878 showing in sequence a slab which later turned up after 1931 uh, in, on the market. They are now, rather interestingly, two on the West Coast here, Los Angeles and San Francisco, and one in Detroit and St. Louis. These two, interestingly, ended up being purchased by the institution at a completely different time. So it's a complete coincidence that neighbors in the site are now sort of geographical neighbors. They're on the same coast. Uh, so, um, and that is, that is the direction. It is with these fragments that I start to wonder um, whether they were preserved somewhere else for a couple of decades in, within Iran and then redistributed from an Iranian collection um, at the point in 1930 when it became clear that the market would happen now or never. This goes on. <laughs> there are a, a number of more, and I'll just show you this, I guess, one last example. The one on the left is a lovely um, uh, large relief, which is in Cincinnati now, um, and which you can see just on the far left here. Of these, only this middle guard on the facade of a palace of Xerxes survived in the site and was later restored to its position in this broken zone here. So this is the same area between 1878 and 1930, pretty much. And similarly, finally, there was greater access to the site um, for looters during the excavation, despite the best efforts of Iranian gendarmes who were posted on the site and of the expedition who were living on the site year round, but nevertheless, it's a still a large complex um, with a lot of people, hundreds of people working on it, uh, and therefore um, possibly difficult, and I'm still trying to get to the bottom of this, possibly difficult to police. However, after that major slab removal, these, piece, these pieces that come out during the excavation are usually very small. And anything that, that comes out after this point of control, documentation, recording, does tend to be very small indeed. Um, there, I have a few mysteries that I haven't got to the bottom of yet, but the one example I'm giving you here is a small fragment in the middle that is in Toronto now, was actually photographed in the site after excavation in the central building in 1934, and then again in 1936, it was still there. What you have here is a small ancient repair plug which has become fragmented at the point when the structure became slightly decomposed, as it were, and so it's vulnerable. And one thing I want you to take away from this is that when a, an area of a site like this is fragmented, it serves as a temptation to those who think, well, this part is already broken. And that harks back to the rhetoric of the 19th century. It's like, well, I did no violence because I took the piece that was already detached. And you can see that somebody has rationalized that in this case with a series of these heads, including the one now on display in Toronto. Um, and when one examines the one in Toronto, one finds that it is incredibly slim and trimmed and neat, presumably because somebody had to illicitly remove it. Um, it's a, it, I, of course, I don't have the, 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 the full documentation of many of these episodes, uh, so a lot of my suppositions are based on um, uh, reading the implications of the nature of the object themselves. The adjoining fragment was found later in the site, just to kind of uh, back up the fact that this was presumably uh, taken apart during the closing period of uh, excavation. And so a few, there are a few episodes in, um, of, of looting 
during this excavation, which again are counter to our understanding of how fragmentation and looting works. In all of these cases, and this is where I have an open set of conclusions, in all of these cases, there is a complicated relationship with some scientific investigation. Scientific enterprises of, ex of excavation seem to uh, expose the site to further um, uh, um, looting as well as to further understanding. Uh, past removals are not lost in Merck. They can be documented, and there should be much documentation for any antiquity from a site that has been out of it for a long time. If there isn't, it may not have been out of that site for very long. Um, there should be documents wherever you find them. I will talk more about that hopefully in questioning as well, wherever you find a piece. And fragmentation, especially in that last case and also in other similar cases around the same time, fragmentation leads to further fragmentation. Where one piece is slightly broken, it will encourage further chipping. And quite a lot of the larger pieces even that I have examined as part of this project in museums show signs of earlier attempts to remove them, which have then led somebody else to kind of think, well, I can try that there, but in a slightly different angle, and I will successfully take it. So it can be a very gradual, almost geological process in itself, uh, rather than that kind of cataclysmic destruction that we often um, imagine. Finally, I want to point out that objects all have their own biographies and identities in their new locations, and the cultural richness that emerges from tracing that can really enhance our understanding of how the site is constructed externally to Iran and how um, it provokes imaginative responses once it has left the site as well. And in that sense, I'm trying to be a historiographer of destruction um, rather than necessarily a, a campaigner. I'm trying to open up really the documentation for consideration and uh, further action. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for this talk. So it was kind of an introduction actually uh, to a conversation we hope to have with you. Um, I'm going to start by two questions right now. Um, my first question would be actually, um, what are the mo major challenges that you face in your research? Maybe you could give us two um, key challenges that you face while doing your research. Um, can everybody hear me on this? Yeah. Um, distance. Um, so despite the digital facility um, that, that, that one can deploy in doing this kind of research now, you still need to move personally. And you still need to have the time to uh, liaise. I mean, it's, it, the difficulties are also the pleasures. Um, so to liaise with different institutions, to research those different institutions, to understand everybody's needs, everybody's expectations of your research, uh, and to try to just keep talking just keep the, the uh, keeping the conversation open across multiple institutions has been has been hard as much as I've welcomed it and wanted to do it all mm. the time. Um, and the other thing is 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 it's it's relatively unusual to do this kind of dogged pursuit pursuit of different individual pieces. And I have I have had a few responses from other academics who have been like, <laughs> doesn't that happen to every site? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is true. Uh, but but one of the things I'm now determined to prove is that each site has its own geography. So mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. still a challenge to try and reify that and communicate it. Mm -hmm. um, you are very um, transparent also. You use Instagram, you use Twitter, um, all of these social media for your um, discoveries. Recently you were even in Japan, so for uh, finding one piece. Um, here in Washington DC, just for the audience, we have also two Persepolis stone reliefs that are in Dumbarton Oaks um, in Georgetown on display. Um, my question is, is there one person that emerges uh, from, <laughs> if you are willing to talk about this, from uh, this long history that you studied also, as the Elgin maybe that we have in, uh, in Greece, for instance? I mean, is there one person that emerges you can hint on um, is responsible for a lot I, of... I, I can do more than hint. I mean, okay. <laughs> hmm? I mean, in the early 19th century, it's the institution of the British East India Company, okay. really. Mm -hmm. uh, but the kind of society that exists within that rather than a sort of state-sponsored mm -hmm. plunder. It's definitely not state-sponsored, it's private. Mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the 20th century, what I didn't uh, sort of highlight here, but, 
really needs another whole paper, and I have a whole other paper on that, is uh, the, the, the kind of bursting of Persian art as um, an idea, as a, as a desirable acquisition from museums um, onto the world stage, not just Britain where, and Europe, where it had existed for a while in the 19th century, but particularly in a, a host of new um, museums in North America. Um, and the person who wanted to cater and indeed promote um, Iranian culture to those institutions was a guy called Arthur Upham Pope, um, who is very significant within the history of both Islamic and pre-Islamic art. In Islamic art, he did publish on it. He and his partner, Phyllis Ackerman, published uh, and studied um, Islamic period artifacts. Uh, for pre-Islamic art, he was much more of somebody who kind of facilitated its transition to use neutral terms, uh, between sellers and institutions. Um, and, and his name does crop up when the Chicago Oriental Institute are rather horrified to find a large number of reliefs on the market just as they are starting their dig, which could endanger their access to this project. Um, they ask Ernst Herzfeld um, about the availability of these huge pieces, which must have been left by truck, uh, and he said, well, it was Mr. Pope <laughs> and his colleague, an Iranian dealer called Rabanu. And uh, we have just Hertzfeld's word for it at the moment. It does make sense because he's, he was exporting a large number of artifacts around that time for an exhibit in London, the International Exhibition of Persian Art. Mm -hmm. um, so it's conceivable. The other thing to point out, though, is that, as I mentioned, Hertzfeld himself was accused of smuggling. Yeah. Um, although what the uh, items that I found connected with Herzfeld seem to, be con seem to be more confined to particular items from his, his historical surveys, which he kept as, um, let's say, a study collection, or um, the other thing which I emphasized in the talk, um, this distribution of finds to possible patrons or supporters, which he did do a little bit too. Mm. So there's a difference between Pope and Hertzfeld, and Pope mm. was, was perhaps encouraging the rather more industrial side of, of the diaspora mm. of, of pieces, yeah. Mm. Thank you. So I would rather open the floor now to um, the audience, and I see already a lot of hands um, up there. Maybe a student can help us, um, Rachel, for um, giving a micro. Maybe you could just yeah, speak loud also that the audience um, is understanding. Uh, I think, yeah. Thank you. Uh, this is not an academic question at all. I'm a Zoroastrian, and Persepolis has particular, uh, a very special significance for me. What is it about Persepolis that you know uh, that interested you to start this um, this study? Why not some other, uh, you know, place, uh, ancient uh, place? I'm I'm just very uh, interested to know. Um, I am very interested in the history of scholarship. That's a great question. I, um, I'm very interested in the history of scholarship um, of, of Iran and of the ancient Near East as a whole. And the site is prominent for a reason because, because it was the only kind of extant site. So it has a huge cultural history. It has a big cultural biography as a place. Um, it had multiple lives intersected with it. There have been multiple constructions of its religious and so social meaning. Um, so it, it has many different constructions, and that's fascinating to a historian. Um, the other thing is, I guess, I, I visited it um, when I was young and impressionable, as, as the whole of the country itself, which I, 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 I think is beautiful and, and inspiring. Um, and it is, it is a site that is de designed for interaction and sort of uh, uh, and involvement. For c it kind of invites you in as a place, as a way of working it out. And I think it, that was kind of something that was designed into it. It's certainly a place that had, three, you know, uh, was a key to the decipherment of cuneiform um, in the early 19th century. So it, it's a very important site from the perspective of the history of my area of study, uh, but also the history of the ancient Near East as a whole, so so it, it's a really great center point for all of that. Mm -hmm. Yes, at the very back. Thank you for being here this evening. 
Um, my question is actually about the preservation of the sites themselves. You mentioned briefly that uh, sometimes people took the pieces, but now they're finally uh, coming back and being put back into place almost like a puzzle. Uh, what provisions are being made right now to kind of keep those pieces in place so they're not just taken one more time? Are there people that kind of patrol every once in a while to make sure that those aren't taken away or any laws and regulations to punish people that uh, do take pieces? Um, I mean, the, the span of my study has been focused on the historic plunder because that is the point of vulnerability that has been most notable. Um, the, cent the site is now fenced. It has a resident study institute on site. It's kind of, it's populated. It's, a, it's, it's, it, it's got a, um, a, a large population of guards. When you go in the morning um, for at dawn, as I have two hours before it opens, because I'm an idiot, um, you see guys patrolling uh, who, who are armed. Um, it is very closely watched. And where there have been um, attempts to, to interact with the site in recent years, those have been picked up and stopped. Um, so I think what is m more worth emphasizing is the amount of documentation and a, a kind of the great, the great history, long history of engagement with sites like this, um, because as far as I'm concerned, that's a defense against, under any circumstances, future damage. If you document, represent, and very thoroughly investigate the existing kind of destruction that has happened, you have a much better weapon to counteract future vulnerabilities at any site. And, and this, is, I, this is something why I want to kind of promote this kind of approach, a kind of historical approach, um, as, a, as a facilitator of protection of many sites. We talk a lot about res restoration, sort of imaginative restoration of sites that may have suffered destruction. Uh, but I think the historical documentation is, is massively crucial um, to the future safeguarding of, of sites against fragmentation. But I would, I would assure you that Takhti Jamshid is very central to, you know, Iranian sense of self and pride, national pride and, and is very closely um, conserved. Yes, all of, okay. So likewise, thank you for being here. Um, I just sort of wanted to build on this last question. Um, we've sort of talked about, too, how a lot of artifacts are centralized in Western European and American centers of study, you know, and a lot of them go to places like that. Um, but sort of we also have this cluster of information and historical sort of evidence and sort of weight in the actual sites. Um, have you encountered most artifacts being taken to these Western sites versus kept where they originated? Are there benefits to keeping them where they came from to study them better in context? And sort of, sort of what can you say about that, I guess? Thank you. Um, I mean, what I would say is that the, the removals that did happen, especially circa 1929, have kind of hampered our understanding. Not because sort of any great lost single key has gone, uh, but because we have lost um, the kind of overwhelming impression, we have uh, lost some of the shape, some of the space that we would otherwise use to interpret the site. Um, the other thing that I would say is that I, I really want to emphasize that when one part is broken, it, through, the eight, through from sort of circa 19, uh, 1800 to 1930, when one part was broken, further damage tended to follow. So even though there was um, the, uh, the idea that, that things may have been conserved, even with Hertzfeld, to study, uh, to share, to, to kind of protect, that could lead to, to further damage. So in any case, you, you can't necessarily, a, a scholar of those, that era could not necessarily predict um, that their actions would lead to further damage, but that is often what did happen. Um, what, is in, what I found fascinating about this research study is the degree to which many of these fragments are orphaned in their individual museum collections, and that is purely a product of the market, of, of the antiquities market of the early 20th century, and of changing collection priorities in which Iran's cultural profile has changed, um, and certain pieces can be left in store, um, it, can be, it can be forgotten exactly where in the building they came from. That information may never have been transmitted with them. So all of those problems tend to accrue to the museum objects, that they, they, despite the best efforts of curators who often really work to try to contextualize them, 
um, it's very much more difficult to, con to restore this context to pieces because they are buildings and they are not displayed as buildings, they're, dis they're displayed as art. Um, reoriented, reoriented, separated, and so on. Does that help? Yeah. Maybe I can add actually one uh, issue also, the issue of polychromy of color on these mm -hmm. uh, facades. So I mean, I have worked on the site since 2006. You find a lot of pigments on the uh, stone reliefs on the site. But when you go to the museums, um, often this uh, surface has been cleaned uh, in some procedures. Mm -hmm. So um, this happens, actually there's a large bull that was um, um, excavated by the Chicago team in the 1930s, which is now in Chicago, and it has been cleaned. So while the bull in uh, Persepolis has still lots of color pres preserved, so this is another um, s loss that also happens in some point, point with this. Okay, just to follow up. Yes, there are many hands. Okay. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, you mentioned very briefly at the beginning your interest for the future in digitizing uh, um, the, the three-dimensional measurements of objects. It, it, it seems like there's p potentially uh, the possibility of automating this process of, 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 of tracing the history of objects through, through uh, 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 technology. And I would just wonder whether you would elaborate what might be possible, what people are thinking of being able to do along those lines, and uh, uh, are there any projects that are taking that on now? Um, I th so I can tell you what, what I've been observing and what I am hoping to plan. I am not a great technical genius <laughs> but I, I, I as you as you have also noticed uh, there is massive potential out there with what one can do um, one a project which I'm just about to start is the process of entering all of this data um, in a, um, a, a data set which will be geographically modeled and compared to other object data sets so that the more object data that we add in to a sort of geographical context with a historical, a chronological line of analysis, the more we can see patterns in object spreads. Uh, I, uh, uh, somebody referred to this wonderfully as an object drain pattern, which is what one can see happening, for example, in Iran with other art objects from the late 19th century onwards. Um, and then clustering, and one can start to reconstruct and, re and, and model the, the kind of movement of objects across the world in, in these kind of herds. It's, it's, it's almost like population movements. So at the moment, I'm, I'm collaborating with a geographer in King's College London who um, works on population movements and transport movements. And we're trying to apply those geographical methods to art objects. But I think it's a much wider set of possibilities and it will take more projects than just one project to kind of crowdsource those ideas and I see this happening with um, there's a wonderful project in uh, University College London tracing the spread of artifacts from excavations by Petrie who was an Egyptologist in the early 20th century and again that's a slightly different enterprise because it's objects from excavation that were at some point documented at least in pre-distribution uh, or to a certain extent um, but again, that provides a, a richness. Uh, it provides a, a rich depth to our understanding of sites. There's a sort of deep understanding of sites and our collections, which we have previously not had, but which technology will give us more and more and more power to analyze and, and visualize. Mm -hmm. Yes, we should probably go to the front. Yeah. Mm. Hi, thanks very much for us first of all, for the really interesting uh, lecture. I'm, my question actually is about the pigments that were used that covered this. Without the pigment, are the, is the stone more permeable? Is it more likely to derode more quickly without the pigment than wood had the, had the practice of putting the pigment on would have preserved the the, the the surface is better. I, I just wanted to know about the yeah. function of the pigments. I mean, first thing I should say is also that the additional structures, roof structure, mud brick, um, and timber roof structures were, were an essential part of protecting um, the wider stonework as well. 
Um, and it's certainly very true that anything that was exposed for a particularly prolonged po point of time, we can see a sort of interesting differential erosion happening that certain parts of the stone will stand out proud of the surface and then so other parts will uh, erode gradually. So there's a definite erosion process. In some of the pieces uh, excavated and removed quite promptly, there is a certain sort of whitish mm -hmm. surface covering which the most recent Italian-Iranian teams working at the site have analyzed to be a sort of lime wash, mm -hmm. um, which may be A, part of protection, but P, B, B, also part of a, a way of um, preparing the stone possibly for further pigment. But Alex will have mm -hmm. more opinions yeah. and information on that than I think. Yeah, no, I think, um, I mean, the question was, and, and, and the answer was very right. So, I mean, of course, the pigments pr protect um, lots of the, the surface of the stones. So we also have actually metal uh, inlays in many of the fragments uh, of the larger uh, buildings um, that are lost today also. So we have beards uh, in um, the, the rulers' um, faces that are gone today. Um, of course, yeah, these were all originally part of this whole iconography and protected also in some ways the, the monuments themselves. Yeah. And kind of added life to the yeah. and, and being to the figures. Yeah. The, the fact that they actually had sort of three-dimensional jewelry in some yeah. cases, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they, they tends yeah. gives them a different dimension. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, here was another question. There were rumors that large portions of, uh, of the stones from Persepolis were taken and uh, shipped out of the country. Do you know if such fragmentation took place? And if so, where did they go and who was responsible for that? So I have just been tracing the history of all extant fragments that I can find. And I, I the, the profile of removals of those fragments um, is is much earlier than 79. Um, I'm unaware of really any um, uh, major, what, what you say is sort of major removals um, that are associated with the 79 um, events. Um, and uh, as far as I can tell, the, the, the narrative that, that, that is known within experts of Iran is that the, the site um, director of the time, Shah Pazi, was actually protective of the site. The local people of the site were protective of the site, even if there were other ideological objections to it. It, it was it was protected. So um, I'm not aware of any any major damage that was associated with that phase. So, so it's certainly not just from my kind of wholesale trawl through anything I can find. It's just not been uh, a major focus. Mm -hmm. I guess, I guess one thing I should say, just to, some, sorry to interrupt, to, to postpone the next question, as, a, as an interesting historiographical observation, is that when there are repeated narratives of destruction, um, it tends to be about local politics. So when mm -hmm. I said that there was a Safavid governor who was criticized, that's the one narrative that one actually finds repeated in print over and over and again. There was this terrible governor, oh no. You know? mm -hmm. And, and there's very little that I can actually attribute to, to him. Um, so what I would say is that there are repeated narratives of destruction, which one finds repeated over and over again. But when one documents it, you often find documented um, episodes which are not written about and not talked about. And the 1929 to 1930 episode, where one can see a lot of things leaving immediately, and the do it's visually documented. Um, that is not something that is talked about until now. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I was wondering if, uh, in your opinion, uh, with the redistribution and the removal of the fragments from Takta Jamshid over the last 200 years, um, even though it has negative impacts historically and archaeologically, do you think that with all these museums around the world having these fragments that it contributed to the site's popularity? I would certainly agree that the, the, the presence of these pieces worldwide reflects the fact that it is a global 
heritage sites. It, 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 and it is true of any heritage site which has had this kind of redistribution, that it is part of the magnetism that, that sort of feeds back into the need to acquire more pieces. Um, I wouldn't say that necessarily contributes feeds into popularity because um, in the, the kind of the proportion, I think museums do their best in presenting their objects as well as they can, but I think the isolated appearances of a lot of these pieces doesn't necessarily immediately spur a kind of uh, popularity surge of the site. I think there's a kind of conversation going on between the site and its delegations that are now elsewhere, its emigrants. Um, I, I do tend to use a lot of po population terms when talking metaphorically about the movements of the objects, that there is a sort of exile uh, process, that there's a, there's a migration process in how they move geographically. I just use all those words to kind of help myself conceptualize it. So there is something in the site which is about, um, let's say, talking about di diversity of population, which I think has fed into and powered its distribution, its redistribution. And there is a relationship definitely between the prominence of the site uh, and the diaspora. Um, but I, the popularity judgment, I think that's, that's a bit more problematic to call it that. So. Yes, on the very back. Could you talk a bit more about um, the extent of the regional spoliation and um, whether there is documentation on the extent that there is for the spoliation that led to artifacts being displayed in the West? Um, sorry, are you asking whether I should, I, I'm linking spoliation to the, to the later display of artifacts? Oh, or? no, um, I'm, I'm just asking, because uh, you mentioned during the presentation about um, how some of the some of the material was removed and reused architecturally within the region. Um, mm -hmm. What is the extent of that compared with the uh, removals that went to the West and what kind of documentation exists for that versus the documentation that you found for removals to the West? Okay, it, it's very different is the, is the short answer. Um, there, there seems to be, an, especially an early Islamic effort to, uh, let's say, invest some local constructions with obvious antiquity by using a cumin of pieces, but the kinds of structural pieces that are, that are used tend to be uh, gate, sort of doorways, entire doorways, so entire pieces. Pieces don't tend to be broken up, it's just large slabs that are moved to act as structural pieces. So the things that have survived both in Istakha and also near Shiraz, so it's two locations, uh, that we have surviving archaeological information on. Um, those are entire architectural components which are taken out and re rearranged and reused. Um, there, with Isfahan nearby, there is a sort of uh, literary allegation that some column bases were taken there, and I think Alex saw uh, a fragment of a column base in Isfahan that, 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 that might be uh, a Cumanid, which I think possibly is a Cumanid. Um, but we don't have an awful lot of backup documentation of that. We just have a kind of the mm. image or the idea that in the new capital there was some of the old capital. Um, and so these things tend to be used quite with quite a lot of ideological um, uh, significance. And that's very different from, from most of these other uh, phases. What I would say is that the, the, the British phase is a little bit of a hybrid case, the sort of 19th century phase where they, they are also trying to take large stretches out. I mean, there is a, a large segment of a side of the Apadana, of the large audience hall, which is taken out by these, these early 19th century East India Company types. And it all ends up in West London. <laughs> so one could almost argue, and I tend to try to in my more fanciful moments, that this is a, 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 um, a kind of a, a site reoccupation. Like I, I, I do tend to style that as a site reoccupation external to the site, that it's a, effectively a, a London ma a manifestation of one of London's efforts to become another, a new imperial capital, which it is obviously trying to do at that point. Um, so the, 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 the technique, the approaches, the documentations are, are quite different between the two, 
apart from that kind of aberrant phase in the late 19th century, I would say, where there may have been collecting locally to the province in the elite, and I don't, I, because I'm not researching in, in Iranian archives, I don't have uh, documentation of that, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers that. Good question. Okay, in the back. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, taking it to a little bit different angle, I'm wondering if there are models around the world of sites that have been particularly well preserved, that allow for engagement, that allow for um, research and study, and allow for community pride about the site, um, that serve as models for other places. I, I was in uh, China this summer and saw the Terracotta Warriors, mm -hmm. and it, it's a very accessible site, um, but very well preserved as well. And you can see the, the work that is ongoing by the archaeologists and the scholars right there on site. Um, but it's, it, it's at a safe distance, and people can you know, be part of it, but not, but not be um, interfering or be able to damage it in any way. So I'm wondering if you can, um, if there are examples, something that sites like Persepolis and others could maybe adopt uh, or, or learn from, um, you know, that countries might be able to employ to try to do a better job of preserving these sites. Um, that's a really great question, and I think Alex might have some views as well. <laughs> but, um, what I, I, I agree that um, th that is actually a, a really great model. It tends to be the more... What I would say is that what I would be interested in doing is putting some of these sites on a geographical spectrum or continuum of comparison so that you have more controlled, perhaps more recently excavated sites with minimal diasporas or minimal redistributions or controlled redistributions compared to sites with a longer history of interaction. And I'm afraid I tend to deal with the more um, scurrilous end of the research uh, spectrum. So I'm actually struggling to think of places that have not suffered yeah. uh, major redistributions, mm. <laughs> other than think places perhaps more recently excavated, yeah. um, Bronze Age sites in Crete, um, mm. things that are have not had a kind of corona of interaction. Mm. Um, and I think possibly d the digital era, as it were, opens up other phases of appropriation. Part of the, the issue of the 200 year stretch between 1800 and, and 2000 especially is the need to own a piece by owning substance or by having sub substantial material contact with the site. And I wonder, although we are now very interested in haptic experiences and kind of try to talk about them a lot more objectively, um, I wonder whether that, that phase of thinking about sites as something that you should own as an individual piece that's part of your own collection is perhaps beginning to recede. So I, th I guess what my answer is to say, I think of this in a more of a historiographical context, and I haven't been paying as much attention to the good practice, uh, but part of what I'm trying to do is establish good practice for bad situations. Okay, so I think we should uh, stop for now, and you may have more questions to the speaker at the reception, followed afterwards, so I wanna give a applause, applause for uh, Dr. Allen. Mm -hmm. And maybe one more thing also, I think that as you see, have seen perhaps, Persepolis is still inviting, I think, for research, for, um, for exploration also, with everything, the books that have been written about this, the uh, history about Greece also in Persia. I mean, this whole, um, where is Persepolis on display? It's sometimes right next to the um, Greek uh, galleries and, and elsewhere. So there's plenty of work to explore for you. So if you want to yeah, follow and, um, yeah, do your own research, of course, maybe one day we sit here and then have a conversation about this. So, so, many, so many avenues, so yeah. many avenues. And thanks for your really great questions. That was really interesting. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Hmm?